this time we are moving on to Nintendo Power 53 for October of 1993. We have a major fighting game in this issue, along with a couple other competitive titles. In spite of the presence of Mortal Kombat, our cover game this issue is Super Empire Strikes Back. Mortal Kombat is mentioned, certainly, but not prominently. I almost feel like the editorial staff is a little ashamed of the game. In the letters column, we have a letter from a dad who's been bonding with his son through Nintendo games. Aww. We have a map for the second Super Star Wars game, Super Empire Strikes Back. The article is maps of levels 1 through 3 on Hoth, stage 1 for the Rebel base, and maps of the Dagobah stages. This game has some rather obnoxious platforming, starting really early with the game's second level. As with Super Star Wars, the game throws a ton of enemies at you at once, all of which cause knockback when they hit, and it has some distressingly imprecise platforming, with sudden death consequences. It's kind of a bummer. It really goes to show, like, the Super Star Wars games, while they have great graphics, while they have great cutscenes to tie them into the narrative of the films, that they try considerably hard to fit with the narrative of the films. From a gameplay standpoint, at least for me, they don't quite work. And it makes for a really unenjoyable series of games. Even this one. And here's the game I've been actually waiting for, Mortal Kombat. We have notes on each fighter, how to fight them, how to fight as them, and how to beat Goro with them. Each bio comes with a one-page comic showing off their motivation. Or one-panel comic, rather, showing off their motivation. Mortal Kombat, as a fighting game, has a bit of a problem with muscle memory. Because the game has a designated block button instead of pressing back the block, I, as a player, end up getting hit more often than I'd like. I think this, combined with the violence in the arcade version, is what led to the hard dichotomy between Mortal Kombat fans and Street Fighter fans in the early 90s. Both games are very popular, but fighting games are as much about quick reactions and muscle memory as they know are about knowing what moves to do when. To a degree, it has that much in common with actual martial arts. When you observe an opportunity, muscle memory kicks in and you just do it, rather than mentally going, now I will do this action, and then performing the action. As far as the Super Nintendo version of the game goes, it controls well enough. Okay. Mapping blocked the shoulder buttons was the right idea, as using the shoulder buttons works better as a reflective action than holding down a face button. Standard attacks are limited to two kicks and two punches, which are fairly well placed in the face buttons, with the high attack being the higher of the two on its axis, and vice versa for the low attack. Now, the elephant of the room for this game is the lack of blood. No gouts of blood when someone gets hit, no fountains of blood when someone gets uppercut into the pit, that sort of thing. The over-the-top violence was part of the game's original appeal, and I'll admit that with this first installment of the series, when it hadn't started building up the mythology of the setting, and we hadn't gotten the gameplay refinements of later titles in the series, having that violence means a lot. I would say, frankly, the Genesis version of this game is much more worth playing. Next is Super Bomberman. We have notes on gameplay and power-ups, as well as notes of the enemies and levels in single player. So before I get into the single player, I will mention that I played a ton of multiplayer Super Bomberman in middle school and high school, and this is a game that is legitimately great fun in multiplayer. It is one of those titles where it is just as fun to play if you are losing as you are winning, like with Worms. Now as far as the single player goes, the single player version is more of a action puzzle game with Bomberman clearing paths through the environment in order to find the exit, and then destroying all the enemies to open the exit. The game controls fine, and it's certainly fun, but the multiplayer is really where it's at. Next is another uh, Super Nintendo mascot platformer with Plock, a platformer from Trade West. There are some notes on the first few worlds. Plock is a neat platformer. While the visual style of the game feels like an Amiga title, it doesn't have that unpleasantly floaty platforming that other games based on Amiga or PC platformers have. That said, the game for some reason has no continues, which is a bloody nuisance. It certainly has a lot of flair, and once again the controllers are the controls are fine. It 
just has that mess of, well, you have to beat the entire game in one series of continues. Unless there are continues in the, that are found in the environment and they don't just intrinsically have. This time in Nestor's Adventures, there's a tip for rock and roll racing. Let the, your, your opponents blast ahead and expend their weapons, and then move in and blow them up yourself and get to the front that way. Next is Cool Spot, another game with a mascot, in this case the 7-Up mascot, and it's a platformer. We have maps of the first six stages. Cool Spot is a collect-a-thon platformer, where each level is based around collecting enough generic spots to unlock the location of an animated spot, which you must then free to complete the level. The game controls fairly well, but the enemies are excessively squishy, in the sense that it takes way too many shots to bring them down, which is aggravated by the fact that the game's view is a little too close to the action, so you, you get bigger and more expressive sprites, but you can't plan your moves ahead at that well. This leads to too many blind hits from enemies and obstacles in the environment. And the game is fun, but it requires more memorization than I like, in the sense of, well, you know, memorize, you have to go to this place in this order, and you gain this memorization not by exploring the level, but by dying over and over again, and having to pick up where you left off the last time, because you hadn't memorized where that enemy was. Continuing with mascot games, we have Pack Attack, a puzzle game featuring Pac-Man. So, this is a falling block style platform, a la Tetris, but the twist is that the ghosts drop in addition to blocks, and occasionally so does a Pac-Man. When a Pac-Man blocks, he will move to the left or right, um, eating ghosts, and once the ghosts are out of the way, any blocks that those ghosts were holding up will drop. Any completed lines will clear, giving points, and comboing multiple lines will give you more points. It's pretty standard with a decent twist, though as far as combo-based puzzle games go, I prefer Penalty Pon and Puyo Puyo a little more. Wrapping up the Super Nintendo section, we have Wing Commander The Secret Missions, a standalone expansion for Wing Commander. So I've done a little research. The main problem I had with the first title was with the controls, that they were very complex for the Super Nintendo, and that the game was better suited to be played on a PC than with a controller on a console during this period. And this title is running the same engine, and has the same controls, and it's a, just a bunch of new missions with no real mechanical tweaks, and often these missions are leading towards being more difficult, because this is an expansion, this is the next level. Once you've beaten the original game, you move on to this. And so, consequently, I'm going to recommend giving this title a miss, and say that if you want more SNES Wing Commander instead of PC Wing Commander, this would be worth picking up. But again, I strongly recommend the PC version of Wing Commander instead. In classified information, we have notes on how to get the Japanese title screen for Brawl Brothers. In the Star Fox comic, one of, henchmen, one of Andros's henchmen has survived in what is basically a serial numbers filed off Gundam and has revived Andros. Starting off the Game Boy section, we have the Game Boy version of Mortal Kombat. I have yet to encounter a Game Boy fighting game that controls well, and this one has the added problem of it doesn't have the, really, the button selection and just a variety of inputs as the Super Nintendo version. Your block button is mapped to select instead of to a shoulder button or something similar, so to block, you have to move your thumb off of the D-pad, which I find to be a no-no. Um, so I am skipping this game and just giving a stock recommendation to, that you skip it as well. Next is Sports Illustrated Football and Baseball. You heard me right. Two sports in one title. I have no idea how this will do both justice. So, of the two sports in this title, I decided to give baseball a try, as... Of the two, it is generally more manageable on the Game Boy. Um, football has, in general, had problems with the passing game in terms of having a field of view that has the receiver and the quarterback 
in frame at one time so you can pick a receiver who is free and pass to them. Baseball, on the other hand, generally works about the same way that baseball on the NES worked, or didn't. So, man, is this game rough. This is the first baseball game that I have played that has had multiple fielding errors by the AI in the game. And this is like, not just like minor errors, this is like errors of sufficient issue that it shows up on the scoreboard errors. Or for that matter, this is the first baseball game I played on the Game Boy where you, if the game would let you, you could swing twice before the ball reaches the plate. The only reason you can't is because when you press the button to swing, it commits you to that one swing and will not reset until the ball passes over the plate. While the fielding for the user is the same subpar fielding that is distressingly common for console baseball games, that's not a point in the game's favor. I'd say the game's main strong suit is that it has very good, very crisp speech samples, and that's not saying much for a baseball game. Don't play this game. Next up is another port, in this case a Game Boy port of the NES version of Jurassic Park. We have notes on the first four stages. Now, I played the heck out of this game at uh, Babysitter's when I was a kid. It is a fairly faithful port of the NES version with a few issues. While the game gets the sprite to field of view ratio right, the Game Boy screen still leaves it with a field of view that is smaller enough, that is smaller in comparison to the NES version to leave some notable difficulties when it comes to navigation. It does not help that all the issues that the NES version had with boxes being randomly bombs and that sort of thing are still there. I can't help but feel for the Game Boy the developers should have refrained from porting the NES version straight and had tweaked some elements of the game, such as the building exploration, to better reflect the limitations of the Game Boy. Next, we have our first Game Boy wrestling game in a while, with WWF King of the Ring. Hogan is back in this game, though Taker isn't. We have some general gameplay notes here. This game controls like a weird bastard child of the NES WWF games and the contemporaneous Super Nintendo WWF games. You have chiptune entr uh, entrance music for each of the wrestlers when you are on the select screen. You have grappling with throws being done by mashing buttons rapidly. But there appear to be no finishing moves, at least not that I can find information about, as there is no fact that I can find for this game. That said, this game has one aspect that is very unique for the times. This is the first wrestler wrestling game that I've covered thus far, and for that matter, the first portable game I've covered thus far has a Create a Wrestler option. It's nothing on par with modern Creator Wrestlers, or even the Fire Pro series as Wrestler Creators, uh, Creator Wrestlers, but it's still notable for having one in the first place. Next, we have a portable version of Lemmings. So, I expect this game to control poorly due to the size of the Game Boy screen, but it worked! This isn't a flawless version of the game by any means, but it controls fairly well, and it lets you change inputs while paused, though you cannot change a lemming type while paused. Basically, you can pause the game, mouse over whatever lemming you want to change, change the selector for type of lemming to the type of lemming that you want to change it to, unpause it and change it immediately, which is close enough to being able to change while paused as to be practically indistinguishable. Uh, so this makes for a fairly decent port of the game, and it certainly paced well for a portable experience. In Counselor's Corner, we have notes on grinding for XP and New Yen in Shadowrun. We have an article about the redesign of the NES, what features have been removed, and what went into the redesign. As far as the features removal stuff, a lot of this is related to the under NES port, which was used for the um, 
uh, NES uh, or the or the Famicom Famicom disk drive, and also AV options were removed as well. For that bit, um, my life in gaming has a video on the topic, and I'll we'll try to link to that in the show notes. Notes. As far the re- as far as the rest of this, that's mainly related. What you want to read this for is related to the mindset behind the redesign. And they basically get into, we designed the original NES to look like a VCR. We don't have to make it look like a VCR anymore. We can now make it look like the original, like the Famicom did. It still without its pro- still has some problems. Um, it does not particularly have a latch to get games out more readily, like the Famicom did. Or for that matter, the Super Nintendo does. And other than that, you have the lingering issue that NES cartridges are designed for a front loader, not for a top loader. But it's a bit late to change that part now. Moving into the NES titles, we have an NES version of Battleship. There is a rundown of the special weapons in the game. Battleship is a game has one thing in common with poker. In order to win quickly, you need to be able to pick up tells, that noticeable relaxation when your shot is a miss, with a lingering sense of tension if it's a near miss. When it comes to computer battleship games, the skill of being able to pick up your opponent's tell is instead replaced by a sort of methodical mindset, the ability to best search the board with the resources available, and with the knowledge of what enemy ships remain in order to figure out what ships are left to attack and how best to search the area. The way NES Battleship expedites this process is by special weapons, or the use of special weapons, that each use a specific shot pattern to better give away to search the board and narrow down where your opponent's ships are. As your ships take damage, the number of special weapons available decreases, which in turn means that you can use the special weapons a little more often in the early game to eliminate large swaths of the board, and then in the late game you're down to single shots, as the number of spaces that opponent's ships Closing ships can hide in get smaller. That said, a single match can still take like up to 15 minutes or longer, which can make things frustrating and tedious. Our final game of the issue is Flintstone Surprise at Dinosaur Peak, which according to research was only released as a rental to Blockbuster Video. This is a platformer with the Flintstones license, obviously, and you have maps of the first three levels. This game is a decent enough platformer with Barney and Fred being able to overcome different obstacles. Barney is shorter and lighter and can pull himself up on vine bridges, while Fred is taller and can thus climb up to higher ledges. The game also has unlimited continues, which I appreciate. However, the game feels just okay. And considering that this game is one of the rarer titles for the NES, I can't justify giving this game a purchase unless you're an NES completionist, in which case you don't need my recommendation to get it. In the top 20 column, interestingly, Street Fighter 2 Turbo has dropped from the top 10, while Street Fighter 2, the original, is still in the top 5. In the now playing column, we have one big title of note with Lock On. Finally, in the Pack Watch column, we have the Super Nintendo version of TMNT Tournament Fighters, Genghis Khan 2, DuckTales 2 for the Game Boy, and the NES version of Star Trek The Next Generation. For my pick of the issue, I am going with Super Bomberman, especially on a system that you can play with multi-tap, by which I mean either a proper Super Nintendo or one of the retro clones that you can hook the uh, multi-tap up to. Next month, we hit the midpoint of Nintendo Power's sixth year, and we and with it, we have another Square Enix RPG on the Super Nintendo. So we have that to look forward next to next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.